guys and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to talk all about treating estrogen dominance. Now, some of you might be wondering, lady, you have a gut health channel. Why are you talking about estrogen dominance? Well, you need to go back and rewatch my other two videos on this topic. I will try to remember to link them in the doobly-doo down below. Otherwise, just go look at my channel, look up estrogen or hormones, and you should find two videos. One all about the acronym PTSD that we're going to use and the other one all about how estrogen dominance is actually very relevant in the worlds of IBS and SIBO. And that being said, without further ado, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this and dissect estrogen dominance. Let's start off by refreshing your memory on what PTSD stands for in this context. In the world of hormones, what we're going to be talking about is production, transportation, aka carting the hormone around in your bloodstream so it can get to the tissues, sensitivity and detoxification. And you can have an issue with hormones at any one of these levels, but there's going to be a different kind of flavor to it with estrogen dominance, at least from what I have seen working with my patients. And recall, if you will, that estrogen dominance can mean one of three different scenarios. It can mean that you have too much estrogen, quote unquote, we're going to get to why I say quote unquote, but you can have too much estrogen, but a normal amount of progesterone. You could have normal estrogen and a deficiency of progesterone, or of course you could have the double whammy where you have both scenarios. You have an excess of estrogen and a deficiency of progesterone giving you even worse symptoms potentially. So think about it from this angle. We're gonna focus quite a lot more on the estrogen piece of it in today's video because that's especially relevant for gut function, but sometimes being mindful of the progesterone piece can be really helpful too. But that being said, if you think about it from the perspective of somebody who genuinely has too much estrogen, and, and we're thinking about it from that perspective, it's not that you lack production. That's not the thing that we need to support the most in this instance. And I would actually make the argument that people with estrogen dominance probably aren't producing too much estrogen as the primary issue that's driving what's going on. And I want to kind of frame this as, this is a little bit philosophical, you can fast forward if you want, but I actually think that estrogen dominance makes a heck of a lot of sense if you think about it from a genetic and ancestral lineage kind of standpoint. If you had a family background, like if you yourself have estrogen dominance and you come from a family where a lot of the women have things like endometriosis and you know really heavy, really crampy periods and a lot of symptoms of estrogen dominance, a couple generations ago, before we lived in this crazy world with all of the stuff that it entails, you guys probably came from a long line of really fertile, amazing women. You were probably popping out babies like you wouldn't believe because you were given from a genetic level. If, you, if you're making a nice hefty amount of estrogen on a day to day, you probably had great baby birth and hips great breasts to feed those babies, and you were probably so fertile, you would just have sex once and boom, you had another baby. But you take that physiology, you take something that could have been wonderful and enviable by all the other women in your tribe or your clan or your group or whatever. You could have been the envy of your town up until a few generations ago. But now you couple this genetic potential to make an abundant amount of estrogen and be a fertility goddess. Plus, now we live in a world with a shit ton of stress and stress degranulates mast cells and we're going to get into why that's relevant in a minute. But we live in a world with a shit ton of stress, a lot of allergenic and inflammatory food, a lot of nutrient deficiencies and chemicals all around us that are endocrine or hormone disruptors. Years and years and years ago, a couple generations ago, your great, 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 great grandma didn't have to deal with things like bisphenols, phthalates, parabens, PCBs. That wasn't around. So her hormones were able to manage just fine all on their own because they didn't have the interference of all of the shitstorm of the world around them. So keep that in mind is that I think that this actually would be a wonderful way to have physiology work. And you probably were the envy of your town up until a few generations ago when we started introducing the stuff like the endocrine disruptors and the antibiotics and the chronic stress and the different kinds of stress. So bear that in mind. I really don't think that people with estrogen dominance truly produce too much estrogen. I think that there are things in our world that muck up the rest of this 
for them. But that being said, you can think about you know, production, you could always support things like vitamins and minerals, dietary protein, making sure that you have the substrate to make the hormones, but that's probably less of your concern if you have estrogen dominance. Similarly, you have so much estrogen in the scenario that it's probably easy peasy for you to transport it around. Even if you have a slight protein deficiency in your diet, you're probably carting that estrogen around like a boss anyway, just because you have so much of it to go around. So I really wouldn't stress the transportation issue quite as much either. But that gets into the sensitivity and the detoxification, which are the first two points that I wanna make, and then we're actually gonna break this down into some other bullet points besides this acronym. Sensitivity can be modified, and it might be a surprising way that we could go about this. Everybody and their brother in the last 10, 15, 20 years has demonized the crap out of soy, but it can be health promoting in certain situations. If you have estrogen dominance, you actually might want to down-regulate or just modulate or regulate your receptor activity so that they're not going bonkers at the sea of estrogen before them. And things like the isoflavones in soy and things like hops and even compounds in red clover, which you could get, I mean, Mountain Rose Herbs, Amazon, you can get red clover blossoms from just about any herb retailer and make it into a lovely tea. But these isoflavones, these phytoestrogens, can be really helpful in modulating, or in this case, decreasing the sensitivity of your estrogen receptors so that they are not chronically getting hyper-stimulated at every turn of every moment of every day. So that is the first kind of piece that you can really think about is the, sorry, that was probably really loud because it was close to my mic. You could think of the sensitivity piece of it being a really useful band-aid, if nothing else, while you're in the throes of treating the root causes of the estrogen dominance. Then detoxification is super ultra mega important. And this is the one I'm gonna focus on the most. Think about detoxification from the liver's perspective and also the gut, because we eliminate things from our body by either sweating, peeing, pooping, or actually exhaling and breathing out chemicals from our body. The main routes are going to be urine and stool. And maybe that's gonna involve a lot of liver work and a lot of gut work. So this is where things like CB, CB, CBS, no, SIBO, SIBO and IBS and dysbiosis can play a huge role in this. It's because your ability to detoxify and excrete excess estrogen becomes compromised in states of dysbiosis, particularly gut deserves its own little, its own little area here. Particularly, the thing that you want to really think about from the gut perspective is the pH of your colon. I know, nobody thinks about this on a day-to-day -day basis, but I swear to God, listen, everybody who has had a GI MAP stool test or a GI effects or perhaps another functional stool test has heard of the enzyme beta-glucuronidase. If you haven't, go Google it. Beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme made by bacteria and it actually helps recycle your estrogen which sounds like a lovely thing until you have too much estrogen. If you have estrogen dominance, you don't want to be pulling a whole bunch of estrogen from your gut and dumping it back into circulation. That's gonna give you more estrogen and therefore more problems. So in this case, you actually wanna facilitate that elimination. You want to poop out excess estrogen as much as possible so that you lower the level in your body. Beta-glucuronidase, that bacterial produced enzyme, is recycling estrogen for you. So it stands to reason if we can decrease the amount of beta-glucuronidase in your colon, then you would recycle your estrogen less and then you would have less estrogen floating around to cause trouble. Now, if you have Googled this or if you are at all familiar with this world, you're gonna come across a supplement, calcium deglucurate, and you're gonna be like, cool, I'll just take that. But that's a Band-Aid. Yes, it can inhibit the enzyme somewhat, but it's only temporarily. And the moment that you stop that, that supplementation goes right back to the way it was. And you have to take quite a hefty dose to really get much of an effect. And you can do things like, you know, indole-3-carbinol. There are other kind of compounds, particularly in cruciferous veggies, that will help downregulate that enzyme. But paying attention to your fecal pH and trying to eat foods and take things that lower the pH of your colon is actually your best ticket. And you could do that every single day through food. What are the things that lower your pH? You might be asking. 
Excellent question, star pupil. Let me just write down pH. The things that lower your fecal pH are anything that will feed the short chain fatty acid producers or lactobacilli or the lactic acid producers. So think about things like perhaps probiotics, particularly lactobacilli, but also think about things like resistant starch, high FODMAP foods, high fiber foods, inulin. Inulin is such a wonderful supplement for this. It's a big old FODMAP. So you've got to work that into the mix at the pace that is appropriate for you if you do have any FODMAP intolerance. But inulin is the absolute number one single best supplement for lowering the pH of the colon, enhancing short chain fatty acid production, and therefore lowering beta glucuronidase. I have seen this time and time and time and time again. I can't emphasize it enough. It's dirt cheap, it's delicious, but it's a FODMAP. So you've got to manage things like motility and the SIBO first if you do have SIBO. But if you can get lots and lots of resistant starch, lots and lots of high FODMAP foods, maybe some supplemental inulin, maybe some probiotics, you're gonna lower the pH of the colon and that inhibits the bacteria that would normally make that enzyme. And again, that enzyme is gonna recycle your estrogen and cause more problems. So ultimately controlling or lowering the pH of your colon becomes your number one ticket to lowering your overall estrogen burden. Then we can also think, if we go back to this word, de oh, I'm getting tangled in my microphone, hold on. Hold on, there we go. If we think about detoxification also, it's worth mentioning the liver, of course. And remember that the liver needs adequate levels of nutrients in order to detoxify and run the enzymes that get stuff out of your body. So think about things like vitamins, especially B vitamins, your minerals, particularly things like zinc and magnesium and chromium. Think about things like dietary protein because you need to build those enzymes of detoxification with adequate protein. Think about herbs that can help facilitate detoxification like dandelion. Think about the things that will support the liver. And that's the first piece of this puzzle is detoxifying and getting it out of your system. Again, cruciferous veggies are wonderful as well. And then you can also decrease the pH of your gut, control the pH of your colon and inhibit that enzyme that would normally cause you trouble. So this is a huge, huge link. The other link that I really want to point out is that of histamine. And likewise, if you're not sure about histamine, how it's relevant, how to know if this is a thing for you, just search my channel. I have several videos on histamine, histamine intolerance, and mast cell activation. And this is a really common thing amongst people with IBS and SIBO. Not universal, but common. But excess histamine will beget higher levels of estrogen, and then high estrogen begets mast cell activation and therefore more histamine. And the two of them go round and round in a vicious, nasty little loop that'll drive you crazy. So if you have a histamine issue, you might need to address that in addition to the other stuff we're talking about for your hormones. So things like perhaps adding in antihistamine compounds either into your diet or via supplementation, maybe lowering high histamine foods in your diet, although I would tend to do that a little bit further down the road rather than a first line of defense. You might even consider doing things like an over-the-counter antihistamine or just lowering allergenic burden, getting a nice air filter, getting a nice you know, pillowcase, dust ruffle, whatever it might be, and trying to lower the allergens in your home. If you have a pet that you're allergic to, I hate to say this, but you might need to rehome that pet. If you have really wicked seasonal allergies, maybe learning how to avoid those allergens to the best of your ability. But basically do everything in your power to not piss off the mast cells so that they release extra histamine because that extra histamine is going to feed directly into the too much estrogen problem. And last but definitely not least, the other thing I wanna point out that is super important for estrogen dominance is the big S, stress. Because remember, not only will stress mess with your gut and it'll clog up your liver chi if you wanna take the TCM kind of approach to this and it'll mess therefore with detoxification. It may or may not mess with all of these other ones. Cortisol does interact with a lot of hormone receptors. So it's possible that stress chemistry in and of itself could impact sensitivity of the hormone receptors to your hormones. But most importantly, and at least in my opinion, stress and stress chemistry directly lead to mast cell activation and mast cell degranulation and excess histamine production. And then you're off to the races. You've got stress, 
your mast cells freak out, try to protect you, honestly. Like, I don't demonize mast cells by any stretch, but you get a stressful event or you have chronic stress, perhaps, your mast cells wig out and release all sorts of histamine and inflammatory leukotrienes and modulators of the immune system. And then that directly feeds into the gut dysbiosis, the detox issues, and the estrogen issue. And you can see how this turns into a very squirrely web that ultimately has to be treated holistically. We can't just pluck out your ovaries and call it good. We can't just say, here, take this drug and you'll be fine skipping off into the rainbows. It doesn't work like that. We've got to look at all of the contributing factors that go into this and make sure that we're actually addressing them. Again, things like supporting nutrition. If you don't have vitamins and minerals, all of this is a moot point anyway. If you have squirrely ass blood sugar that's going all over the place, you're going to have a really hard time managing your hormones and doing any of the stuff on this page because the blood sugar instability is going to cause stress on your body and that's going to fuck up everything too. So you've got to look at it from all angles. But in my opinion and my experience working with estrogen dominance and histamine intolerance a lot over the years, these are the biggest things you need to focus on. Consider modulating the receptor sites with things like isoflavones and phytoestrogens as a band-aid. Support detoxification both from the liver and the gut perspective and support the heck out of your butyrate producers and your lactic acid producers so that they can give you the benefit of a nice low acidic colon pH and decrease that enzyme production. You gotta work on the stress piece. And if you have any sort of his histamine intolerant symptoms, if you are a person who has been plagued by things like asthma, eczema, hives, migraine, seasonal allergies, anaphylactic allergies, phlegm and mucus and lots of sinus infections, you've gotta take care of the histamine piece too. I really hope that this video was helpful in some way in your healing journey, dare I say instrumental. I hope that this puts you on the right path so that you can start treating your histamine, treating your estrogen, treating your gut, and ultimately feeling better and being able to function in this crazy world that we live in. Again, don't demonize your poor ovaries or your poor body for making too much estrogen. It might not be that you're truly producing too much. It might be that the world around us is messing with our liver, our gut, and our microbiome our stress and our histamine, and we live in a world that has created this crazy web. It's not your body's fault, it's the world's fault. But we need to teach your body how it can cope and how it can live in this world, assuming that you do not have a time machine. If you do, let me know, and we'll just send all of the, all of the estrogen dominant people back a few centuries. But assuming you don't have a time machine, this is what we've got to do. We've got to help your body cope and we have to help your body manage all the squirreliness around it and live in this world that we call home. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you in the next video. Also, can we just talk about something as like a YouTuber to a YouTube watcher? I was not bullshitting you. Last week when I posted the first video about estrogen dominance and I said, tell me in the comments down below if you want me to make a video, that was not a trick. I was not just trying to trick you into commenting so that the YouTube algorithm favored my videos. However, side note, liking the videos, and commenting on the videos actually does help the YouTube algorithm share my videos with more people organically. So whenever you get the opportunity, I would love it if you would comment and like the videos. That actually does help me out a lot. But I was not tricking you into doing that. I really just wanted to know, hey, are you, are you at a point where you want to know more about treating estrogen dominance? Or is this a video that's gonna fall on deaf ears and nobody's really gonna be interested in it? So for the record, it was not a YouTuber trick. I actually did wait until the week of Halloween, the, it's two days before this video goes live and I'm just recording it because I wanted to give you guys a few days to chime in and see if you actually wanted a treatment video. So for what it's worth, I actually did wait and film this after I heard back from you guys. Thank you so much for everybody who commented. Again, keep commenting and liking because it does help me get the algorithm to f smile upon me and share my videos more organically. I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.